What's up guys? I know we did not have an A side for this month because we were on hiatus, but we're back with a B side. June had some incredible albums, so I want to talk about them. I got a bunch of great records in this month. I want to talk to you about the albums that I heard that I loved and a bit of music news right now. I got a lot of stuff to talk about, so let's just jump right into it. Alt J put out their third official album. Relaxer. Now, Alt-J is one of my favorite bands, a phrase I say on this channel a lot, but honestly, Alt-J's first album is one of the few true 10 out of 10 albums I know. I love their second album too, it's probably sitting around an 8.5 or a 9. They're amazing live. I could not have been more excited for Relaxer. However, it came out, I gotta be completely honest with you, it disappointed me. That's not to say it's a bad album, because it's not a bad album, it's a very good album. The middle of the album has a strange lull for me. The third track of the album is a cover of House of the Rising Sun, very classic song. I thought that was a very weird choice to throw a cover song onto an album that's already just shy of 40 minutes. Their last albums were fairly long and I was hoping for another hour long epic, but this one was short and mostly sweet, but not entirely all the way through. The fourth song, Hit Me Like That Snare, is one of my least favorite Alt-J songs I have ever heard. It's probably the worst song in their discography, and from there I just kind of lost it for a bit. Dead Crush wasn't that great after that either. Picked up after that, Adeline's a great track, which they released before the album came out. Last Year is one of my favorite Alt-J songs, so there are a lot of good parts of this album. 3WW, the opener, beautiful. Overall though, it didn't win me over. It's like a B, B minus, and I was expecting another A. I'm a little bummed. I did order the signed vinyl, so I was really excited to get a copy of Relaxer signed by the band. The album did come from overseas, and it got beat up in transit beyond repair. It has a corner ding, a pretty big, pretty nasty one, but the worst part of it is the back of it has this giant bend. It is absolutely terrifying. I, I recoiled when I saw it. And of an album where it's signed and you can't really get a replacement jacket, that hurts a lot more than your average album. I emailed them and they were really kind and they refunded me, which is cool. But as a huge All J fan, I would have preferred the proper record sleeve versus the refund. It's cool though, because they do have all their signatures on the front and at least those are not damaged. But um, yeah, a little disappointed in that. In the album, in the packaging, just overall, Disappointment. Amber Kaufman, part of Dirty Projectors, or at least she was up until this most recent album, came out with her debut album, City of No Reply. Now, Amber Kaufman is one of the most angelic voices I've ever heard, and she is one of the main reasons why I love Dirty Projectors. The new album without her was great. It's a breakup album, really emotional. I mean, Dave Longstreth's voice is also fantastic, so that was great. But I was really excited for her album because I've heard her featured on certain songs like Major Lazer's Get Free, and I love her voice, so I wanted to see what she could do on a full album by herself. The album was great. I really liked it. I think it's definitely worth a listen, but it's a little front-loaded. The first three tracks, I was mystified. I thought it was just so well done. It almost sounded like a Dirty Projectors album, a little mellowed out. Her album is also a breakup album, which is interesting to have the two of them come out so close to each other. Listen to the lyrics, it's, it gets pretty intense sometimes. After the first three songs, kind of fell off a little bit. It wasn't bad, it just wasn't ever at that crux that it reached before that. Overall, great listen. I'm gonna have to listen more and hope the rest of it grows on me. Roger Waters put out, Is This the Life We Really Want? His first solo album in quite a long time. Honestly, he's a very political guy. When I saw him at Desert Trip, which was the best show I've ever seen in my life, it was full of political messages, obviously about the current landscape. This album is no different. It is chock full of really intense metaphor and honestly some straightforward criticism of what's going on in this world. The album itself is a great album. Roger Waters is an essential artist in the music lexicon. Pink Floyd is a legendary band for a reason. I mean, Roger Waters, David Gilmour, the two of them together, they make magic. Separate, they're a little hit or miss. This album, definitely worth listening to. If you're a Pink Floyd fan, this sounds like some early Pink Floyd stuff. Not quite as psychedelic and trippy, but definitely having that element of an older style album that's kind of lost in today's day and age. So, excellent comeback album, definitely worth a listen. Phoenix came out with their next album, Ti Amo. Now, Phoenix is a band that I really like. I've seen them about five times live, and they put on a terrific live show, all of their albums are stellar. In fact, the ones before the ones they're known for are just as good. Their first album, United, is a great disco-y kind of dance album. Alphabetical is a really nice follow-up. It's never been like that. Super good. And then Wolfgang Amadeus Phoenix is the one they're all known for and the one that they blew up in the States. After that, Bankrupt was good, but it wasn't great. I liked some of the songs quite a bit, but it didn't have that full album 
flow that Wolfgang did. Tiamo, it, it also kind of lost me, and I think it's my least favorite of the Phoenix albums. Now, it's doing very well critically. It's super upbeat, arguably too upbeat. I was listening to it, and it was sugary, saccharine the whole way through. Excellent beats, and I love Thomas Mars' voice, but this felt like one long song the whole way through. As soon as I was done listening to it, I could not have picked out a single lyric or even instrumental part that I can remember. It just was an unmemorable album. It's not bad, it's inoffensive. So if you like Phoenix, I wanna hear what you think of their new album. One of my top five artists of all time, Mr. Sufjan Stevens, a member of my favorite band of all time, The National, Bryce Dessner, and Nico Moli put out an album called Planetarium. It's a very ambitious project where the three of them worked together and made a song about every single planet and the sun and it was a space concept album, very similar to Age of Odds, which is Sufjan's strangest, most futuristic and electronic album in his discography. I was so excited to hear these guys collaborate, especially with the track Mercury they released, which sounded a lot like a Carrie and Lowell song with a little bit more electronic elements. This album, while good, was way too long. They needed to censor themselves big time. I didn't dislike any of it, but I was drained halfway through. I mean, it is a powerful album sonically, and Sufjan's voice is so powerful and emotional that it was just not the easiest thing to listen to, especially in one sitting. I'll definitely pick tracks that are gonna get a lot of replay, but as for the whole album, I can't see myself revisiting it that often. It's kind of like To Pimp a Butterfly in the sense of, I love that album, but it's so heavy and thematically heavy and long that I can't ever sit and listen to it unless I really dedicate the time to it, even though I love it. So I really like this album, but it didn't quite meet my expectation of what the meeting of these minds would be. Mercury's still a really great track though. Vince Staples, Young Hotshot, making a lot of waves in the hip hop scene, released Big Fish Theory. I've always liked Vince Staples stuff. I haven't really gotten into it to the point where I would put him up on the level of Kendrick, Run the Jewels, Kanye, my favorite artists, but he's always piqued my interest compared to Big Sean, J. Cole, and the other big name rappers that are kind of coming up with their albums and trying to take the crown. Vince Staples actually has a chance of doing it. Now, he hasn't done it yet. I do think that Vince Staples has more to prove. This is not his To Pimp a Butterfly. This isn't even quite his Good Kid Mad City, but he's showing that he has the chops and the whole album was a delight. I loved every beat. I loved all of his verses. The lyrics were great. It was just a really solid listen. It didn't have that immediate replayability where I just wanted to go back to certain tracks after I was done with it, but overall, I was very impressed and I think this is probably the best album he's put out thus far. I think he's definitely a name to watch and if he's not on your rap radar, he should be. Synthwave genius Calm Trues, aka Seth Haley, put out his next album, Iteration. Now, I love Galactic Melt, which was a really fun, grimy, dark synthwave album that was so catchy. After that, he put out a bunch of EPs and rarities compilations that were all good, Nothing amazing. So when he was releasing another LP, I was excited to see if it kind of went back to that Galactic Melt sound or if he tried something new. And honestly, with this album, it's kind of a mix of everything. It sounds like it has elements of Galactic Melt, but it's just really chilled out. It's not quite as dark. It's just a fun listen. It's really good background music, and it's also great with headphones. If you like Calm Trues, definitely make sure you take the time to listen to this. At long last, Fleet Foxes are back with their third album, Crack Up. Now, Fleet Foxes, if you don't know them, they're the band that Father John Misty came from before he left to start his own solo project. But more importantly than that, they have two unbelievable folk albums, indie folk I'd say, that are just lush with harmonies. Robin Pecknell's voice is just as close to angelic as Sufjan Stevens is. They both have these just commanding presences that are so soft and so calming and so crisp at the same time. I loved their second album, Helplessness Blues, so much. It got played almost every day for like the month it came out and I play it consistently to this day. So when I knew they were coming out with Crack Up, I knew I had to buy it. I actually got the Vinyl Me Please version, which was numbered out of 1,500 copies, I believe. And this is number 1016, hand numbered on the back, which was a very nice touch. They could have machine numbered it they went the extra mile. It's on a really cool colored vinyl. It's like this teal kind of aquamarine, hazy, marbly kind of thing. I really like the color of this matching with the cover. I think the cover is this really pretty serene ocean landscape. And this album is vast like an ocean. It is incredibly heavy to get into on the first listen. On a surface level, it just sounds really pretty. I mean, you can't really go wrong with the Fleet Foxes formula and they stick with it. But if you try to dig into what he's talking about and if you really take the time to listen to it, this is not just a sit down and enjoy your coffee kind of album. This is by far the most intense album they've put out. I love it. I want to know what you think as a Fleet Foxes fan. The boys are back. King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, Australian psych rockers, are 
are back with their next album this year. Now, they already had one this year, Flying Micro Total Monana, and this is Murder of the Universe, their second album of supposedly five that they're releasing over the course of the year. So ambitious, they really haven't done too much wrong thus far in their career, and they have a lot of albums out. I have high hopes for it. This album does their whole discography justice. Now, it's very different than their first album, which is cool. It's not just an extension of that. It has its own sound. It almost plays through like a story. It has a lot of droning guitar lines and it keeps you kind of in this trance that a lot of their music does, but there's a lot more speaking on this album over it, which gives it this kind of story-like vibe. And that's very different. That hasn't really been a factor of their previous albums. So I'm really intrigued to listen to this with the booklet it came with. It came with this lyric booklet that has all these amazing pictures and all the lyrics and I bet if you read the lyrics while listening to it it will tell a story so I'm gonna have to give it a real solid listen with the booklet soon I picked up the Altered Beast variant which is a tricolor split of blue gold and green matches the cover absolutely perfectly but the worst part is this came from Australia and I got a big giant seam split right on the spine where it says the name of the album I emailed them to see if they have any more jackets I have not heard back in four days so that is not a good sign, but uh, this uh, that's what happens when you ship a giant booklet inside of your record that can just fly around overseas. Another great output from them sonically. And I have to mention this, so I'm just going to mention it really quickly. Mark Kozlik put out another album collaborating with... <laughs> I have to mention this, Mark Kozlik and Sean Yatin put out an album, another album, after his last album that was barely an album, it was just a weird amount of music that he put out and this is uh no better sean yatin is uh from parquet courts which is a really fun band and mark kozlik is from sun kill moon which was a great artist and i don't know what the hell he's doing these days but i don't <laughs> i don't know what the hell he's doing these days but <laughs> he's so this album was like a, a slam poetry session gone wrong mixed over <laughs> yeah i'm sorry i'm sorry this album's like a shitty slam poetry session <laughs> mark mark you used to make great music. What happened, buddy? Who hurt you? Uh, yeah, I couldn't even get through three tracks. It is just the most bizarre. He's talking about the election. He's talking about making food in his kitchen. It just, it, it doesn't make any sense. And you think that these two musicians together would make something really cool? No, they don't. And the worst part about all this is that if they announce a vinyl release, I'll probably buy it. Music news, not too much to talk about, but I'll keep it short and sweet. If you haven't heard yet, if you're a music fan, I don't know how you haven't heard yet, but Radiohead announced a reissue of OK Computer, their seminal album that some consider to be their best. I think it's their third best, but that doesn't stop it from being a 10 out of 10. It is. This reissue is not just a reissue of the album. They actually added a ton of studio session b-sides from that era, which like I said is considered to be the best Radiohead era. So some of these tracks only had crappy recordings or live recordings up until now. This is the ultimate compilation of OK Computer tracks and I've heard only good things about the master. It is supposed to sound wonderful and there's a box set if you want to go for that. So there's all sorts of options. I can't wait to get mine. Tour news, St. Vincent just announced a tour. She is not coming to California and I'm really pissed off about that. But if you're in an area that she's going to, I highly recommend checking out one of the most talented guitarists and songwriters of our time. She's also a beautiful angel and I love her. And then last but not least, we have to say RIP to Prodigy, half of Mob Deep. Now I'm a fan of Mob Deep because I'm a fan of hip hop and they are iconic, classic, legendary hip hop that really can't be rivaled. The infamous Mob Deep, uh, it's just a huge loss to music and I'm going to be listening to a lot of their music over the next couple weeks because we're losing a lot of people these days, you know, we lost Fife. I mean, Chris Cornell's not a hip hop artist, but this hasn't been a great time for music over the past year and a half. Of course, Bowie, Prince, we're just, we're seeing all of these things happen for artists that mean a lot to my generation. Rest in peace, Prodigy. Speaking of my boy, Mark Kozalik, this is back when he was good. This is a compilation album called If You Want Blood. Now this is the last of his solo albums that I needed to have a complete Mark Kozilek collection. This is a compilation album of two of his EPs. One is called What's Next to the Moon and one is called Rock and Roll Singer. Those EPs consisted of him covering a lot of ACDC songs and a couple originals and they're really, really solid. This is both of them on a two disc with a really cool gatefold, very rustic looking. And I've always held off because it usually went for just a little above triple digits and I didn't want to plunk down the money until I saw someone put it up on Discogs for a hundred bucks as a test pressing. I asked the guy how he got it, and apparently his friend is friends with someone at the label, and he got a test pressing of this album. Now, I could not resist getting this rare record at the price it usually goes for, for a normal pressing. 
So really excited to add this as the last piece of my Kozla collection. My Sun Kill Moon collection still needs April. So if you want to sell it to me, leave me a comment. My buddy Craig runs a record label called I Am Shark and I am a huge fan of them. They have put out a lot of quality releases, especially reissues of Star Wars soundtracks. And they just put out an amazing artist piece version of the Force Awakens soundtrack. There's four different covers, and this is some of the coolest art that I've seen from the film. I picked the Poe cover, because green's my favorite color, and Poe is my favorite character. So this was a perfect combination. And he did a cool thing where he actually matched all of the record covers to the aesthetic of the vinyl itself. So this is the Poe version, which is really cool. Half translucent, half opaque, green splatter. This is one of the coolest looking records in my collection now. How cool is this? This is now the third time I own this record. I have the picture discs and I have the hologram version. So I guess I'm just gonna keep buying it until I'm homeless. Gotta love this gatefold too, which shows the most iconic part of the film, which if you wanna get into a theoretical standpoint, I think that it could have been done a little better, but we can talk about it in another video. Craig, I really want that other version with Kylo and Finn in the forest. These sold out super quickly, so if you got one, congrats to you. Warner Music started a new thing called Run Out Groove, where they ask the people who want to get the records what they want to see pressed or repressed, and they'll press that onto a really high quality record and send it to you. The first one they were kind enough to send me is MC5, the Motor City 5. Now, I know a little bit about them, but I've never really dug into their catalog, so I'm excited to get a record. This is so reflective, too. Uh, it's like I'm shining light all around the room. Uh, I'm excited to get a record I don't really know too much about to dive into. It's always a nice thing. I get a lot of records that I'm already familiar with the artist, and this is one that I get to discover. Cool service, definitely check them out. Next up, I saw a cheap deal on Amazon.com where they had this iconic record, a repress of course, for about 10 bucks shipped. This is Maggot Brain by Funkadelic, considered to be one of the best funk albums of all time, also one of Childish Gambino's chief influences, which we definitely heard a lot of on his recent album, Awaken My Love. This album, Original Press, is so hard to find, at least in good condition, for a decent price. I heard bad things about the four men with beards pressing. This is the Westbound Records pressing, so I wanted to give it a shot. Hopefully the sound quality is decent. I'm sure it's no original, but I think for 10 bucks, this will tide me over. As I'm trying to collect all of the Pearl Jam LPs, some of them are very out of print, some of them are not so out of print. This is one that is not so out of print. This is Lightning Bolt, their 10th and most recent album. An excellent output so late into their career. It's a testament as to why they're such a good band. Now I have a quick story about this. Just when I started getting into records, I found this record at Amoeba for, I think it was like 12.99. And I was like, oh, I've heard Pearl Jam's pretty good. I didn't really know them too well at the time and I bought it. Now, Side B had some skipping on it, and I was like, that doesn't sound great. So I looked it up, and apparently there was a defect within the pressing where a lot of them had a defective Side B. So I emailed the label, even though I bought this used, and I asked them if they would get me a replacement, and they were kind enough to do it for me. They sent me a replacement, but they didn't send me the black vinyl. They sent me a replacement of the limited red that was randomly inserted into people when they bought the first press of this that went for $150 to $200 online. Now that was my rarest record at the time and I was shocked. I couldn't even believe that records went for that much when I saw it on Discogs, but I didn't really like Pearl Jam at the time. I liked the album, but I didn't love it. So what I did stupidly was I sold it to buy records I did love. Now, as a huge Pearl Jam fan, I would love to have that red vinyl. So. I can go back in time and slap myself, I would. We have a soundtrack coming at you right now. Mr. Saul Goodman, Better Call Saul. Now, this is a show where the soundtrack really makes it. I don't know if you watched Breaking Bad or if you watched Better Call Saul, but Vince Gilligan, his shows are made by the music behind it. It drives every single scene in such unique ways. Better Call Saul is no exception to this. So when I saw that there was a limited pressing, a thousand copies with an etched D side, I knew I had to grab it, it's on red vinyl. And this is gonna get some serious play because I love this show. Season three was crazy if you watched it. And every single song I've heard in the show is unbelievable. So I'm, I'm super excited to listen to the score on vinyl. Another soundtrack is a show that's driven by music as well. Game of Thrones, ever heard of it? Now every single season has a really nice soundtrack. And I was like, I can't own five soundtracks of the same show. It's slight variations of the general vibe. So I had to pick one. And I picked season two for a very specific reason. It's a Barnes and Noble exclusive, so the only way to get a copy of this is through Barnes and Noble, which is kind of weird, but I did it. I picked this because not only does it have the amazing score from this season, it has a cover of The Reigns of Castamere, which is an iconic song within the universe, sung by The National, who I said is my favorite band. So I couldn't resist picking season two as the actual record that I went for, and I'm gonna love listening to this all the way through, including that sweet National track. 
Here's a little something for you ambient lovers. This is Brock Van Way, White Clouds Drift On and On. I've been looking at this for a while because this is one of my favorite ambient albums and it's been hard to find for a good price, but I finally saw it pop up on Discogs for something reasonable. It's four discs, so paying 50 bucks for it was not that bad, especially when it retailed for more than that when it first came out. The aesthetic of this record matches the absolutely incredible music. It has this cloudy cover, the gatefold is just as beautiful, and the records themselves look like clouds. I mean, they have this cloudy marbling to them, uh, it's bluish, translucent. It's altogether a really well done package to match an album of this caliber. Now, the first two discs are the album, and the second two discs are a dub techno version of the album. I prefer the album to the dub techno, but they're definitely interesting, especially hearing that interpretation of it. But this album takes so many textures and just absolutely washes over you as you listen to it. It, it takes your, your heart and mind and soul to these places that you never even thought existed. I'm telling you, this is one of the most transcendent albums I've ever heard. Throw on some good headphones and close your eyes and just see where it takes you. Recently had the pleasure of acquiring one of my holy grail records, talking about the self-titled album by The XX. Now I bet you're asking yourself, Matt, I have that. That's a simple record to get. You're an idiot. You know what? You're wrong. This is a version that came out right when the album came out. It's limited to 500 copies and was only sold at an art installation. This is the only version of the album that doesn't have the die cut on the cover. It actually has a gatefold. And when I heard there was a gatefold but I saw no pictures, my mind wandered and I thought there would be all sorts of really cool pictures inside. Unfortunately, there's not. So that to me is a letdown. But it's on two discs, both 200 gram. So they're really hefty. And the D side has an etching on it. The etching is of an X, go figure. But the C side is a Matthew Deere remix of VCR, which is one of the best songs on the album. Matthew Deere is a ghostly international artist that I really, really enjoy. It does kind of like minimal techno stuff. And this is a great remix. The coolest part of this record and part of the reason why it's a holy grail for me is that it came with signed prints of the members of the band. All the prints have their signature, they're really cool, moody, atmospheric pictures to match the tone of the album. And, you know, the actual jacket this record came in has some dings to it, it's a little beat up. But I will say this, this never pops up and the price that I got it for is much lower than the median it usually goes for, so I was willing to take a couple dings to own the ultimate version of one of my favorite albums. And last but not least, I finally got my red signed copy of Kendrick Lamar's Damn. Now, this was cool because it came with a signed gatefold jacket, which I'm going to be framing, and a non-signed jacket. They included both, which was really cool of them. And I also opted in because it wasn't much more money to get the damn shirt. It's just a gray shirt that says damn. Damn. I gotta say, since my review of this album, it has grown on me even more. This is easily up there with his other three albums. This is one of the most impressive hip hop outputs in a long time. And every time I listen to it, I find new things I love about it. So really happy I snagged the limited version because it sold out pretty quickly. Now you can't get it, you gotta get it on black. So have the red one, red looks great. And I'm loving that he has that signed jacket, even though he does that scribbly K, it's the same kind of thing he did on Untitled Unmastered. But I still wanna believe that it was him that signed it. So there you have it, the B-side. Whew, that was a lot to talk about. And I hope that you guys enjoyed all of my albums I got in, all the records I listened to. As usual, I would love to hear what you heard this month that you liked and the records that you got in. Stay tuned for the A-side next week, as well as a surprise for next week, which I think you guys are really gonna enjoy. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe, and we'll see you next week.